Okay, um, assuming we don't have more stragglers, we might as well start. Okay, well anyway, we will get to this argument in time. You were at least able to find the reading, I hope, whether or not you finished it, right? The copy shop, the Kennedy book, that I expect you to get at the library, the other two were in the copy shop. Okay, so, well since not all of you did the reading, we will get to some of this discussion eventually, but there's some ground I feel I did not cover adequately on Tuesday, which will, when was our class? Was it Tuesday? No, it was Wednesday. Um, some ground we didn't entirely cover. We were talking mostly about cultural and institutional factors. I suppose the uh, most dramatic comparisons we were drawing were between the Christian West and the Islamic, well, call it, uh, I guess, Midwest, <laughs> which is to say not the Far East. The Middle East we call it these days, although, of course, the Ottoman Empire was a bit further west than that, its center of gravity being in Constantinople, not usually considered a Middle Eastern city. I guess the cliche is where East meets West, where Europe meets Asia and all of that. Um, that in a way was really, I think, the central geographic or geopolitical fact about the Ottoman Empire was its position. Um, not least because even today people talk about Turkey as a land bridge. A land bridge, of course, for conquering armies, whether it was the ancient army, most famously of Alexander the Great, um, or even more recently of uh, some of the intrigues surrounding the Berlin to Baghdad Railway, which I've actually written about myself. Turkey during the Cold War, obviously, was strategically very important, bordering the Soviet Union while also, of course, bordering and essentially being part of Europe and NATO's defense structure. Uh, Turkey today, people are talking about either a revival of Ottoman power or at the very least a new sort of neo-Ottomanism regional dynamism. That seems to be the intention of the new government, restoring something of Turkey's old role. Again, partly just based on location. Turkey, a country that of course borders many countries in today's world that have strategic importance, um, along with you know, obviously a lot of countries that have oil, not only uh, Iraq, but also Iran and of course Russia. Anyway, so you have location. Real estate agents, when they're selling houses, like to say that location is the most important thing, followed by location, followed by location. Now, there's something to be said for that. However, location doesn't tell us absolutely everything, does it? The Ottoman Empire had a great strategic advantage. I mean, why, after all, did so many Muslims try for so many hundreds of years to conquer Constantinople, Istanbul as it's known now? because the city has a great location, of course. The city has a location astride the Bosporus, where the Black Sea meets the Mediterranean. There is, of course, south of Istanbul, Constantinople, what used to be called the Hellespont. Uh, nowadays, I guess we know it mostly as either Çanakkale or Gülibulu. That is the land bridge, almost like a land bridge, because uh, at their narrowest, the narrows are only about, I guess, 800 meters across. Um, so that you know, even land armies, such as the famous army, army of Xerxes in ancient times, could cross. But more to the point today, if you're looking at geopolitics and economics, the Ottoman Empire was ideally situated for purposes of trade, right? I mean, after all, most trade, at least until relatively recent times, took place in what we call Eurasia. Remember when we were looking at these arguments about questions about why the West dominates, the Jared Diamond book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Have some of you at least read that one? Yeah. I mean, you get the idea about Eurasia, right? That it had this advantage, an east-west axis, which allows dissemination of kind of agricultural techniques, um, domesticable animals, uh, most famously, of course, the cow, although there are many others, um, that these supposedly are these major advantages over a continent like Africa or the Americas. Um, I mean, I personally think there's some holes with the argument, uh, not least when he talks about the Americas lacking domesticable animals. One of his earlier books, he mentioned that the Americas used to have a version of the horse, along with what they called woolly mammoths. What happened to them? I don't think he talked about it in the chapter you read, but can you guess? They, they went extinct, right? I mean, they disappeared. Why? Does anyone know? Well, they were all eaten. <laughs> Basically, instead of domesticating them, the native population just kind of eat, 
They ate them, basically. They killed them and they ate them. So it may not be that the animals were impossible to domesticate. The horse, after all, was domesticated in Eurasia. That said, he makes some good points. Eurasia had serious advantages, not least that you basically had this endless land bridge, right? I mean, this is, this is where supposedly people first filtered out from, from Africa. There are different theories about, you know, the Neanderthals. Um, many of their skulls have been found in Europe, you know, whether they interbred with Homo sapien, etc., etc. But basically you have this spread of ideas, a very rapid spread across Eurasia because everything borders everything else, right? You have a land bridge, which allows for ultimately trade. So that in the ancient world, as I mentioned the other day, the Romans traded through, of course, many middlemen with ancient China, although the traffic as far as goods was mostly in one direction. It was mostly from east to west. The Chinese basically produced the most sophisticated products. The Romans, for the most part, bought them with gold and silver. It's not that the Romans didn't produce anything. They just didn't tend to produce a lot of luxury goods, the kind of goods you would spend lots of money to import. Now, that was also basically true for most of the medieval period in the early modern era, with the exception that there were also a lot of luxury goods produced in places like modern Persia and also in the Ottoman Empire, uh, certainly crafts. Um, you know, things like textiles, you know, even some, some porcelain. Um, still, though, a lot of this was imported, particularly silks, from China. Spices that we talked about were very important, and those were also imported primarily from the southeast, from particularly all of the islands we refer to as the Indies off the southeast coast of Asia. Now, the Ottoman Empire then was ideally positioned because it was in between, right? It was in between Europe and the west and China so that the Ottoman Empire could produce some things on its own, but other things it could simply trade because they came through. Um, in fact, some of the most important products for our purposes in the early modern era, in fact, one of, I think, the most interesting examples. If you look at something like coffee, I talked about tea as well. Other Europeans, you remember, they, they used to just drink booze, you know, probably because they had no potable drinking water in the kind of backwards dark ages. So, you know, they tended to drink alcohol. When it came to food, they desperately wanted spices to preserve it and make it taste better. But they were expensive because they were handled by so many middlemen coming across the whole swathe of the Islamic world. All of these traders that basically held a kind of monopoly. It was on this trade, in fact, primarily that the Italian city-states feasted and became rich. Uh, Venice and Genoa. They were classic middlemen powers. They were the ones who bought the stuff from Muslims and then sold it on to Europeans. Which is one of the reasons why the Venetians and the Genoese were such important players in the early Ottoman era. And of course, before the Ottomans came, when they had these colonies in the ancient city of, well, I mean, the, the Byzantine Empire, the Second Roman Empire, in what we call today Beolo or Pera, um, or Galata, which is to say on the northern shore of the Halic, the Golden Horn. Anyway, so this trade continued to flourish. The Ottomans grew rich off of it, mostly through customs and tariff duties. And so when we look at this global vision of the world that Paul Kennedy is talking about circa 1500, Europe is really the poor of the three thirds, that is, the three sections of this Eurasian landmass. China arguably was still the richest, although in many ways the Ottoman Empire was just as rich, if not richer. And certainly, as I've said, the Ottoman Empire thought of itself as the center of the world. I mean, not least because physically, geographically, it is kind of the center of the world. I mean, what we today call the Middle East was mostly under Ottoman rule, with, of course, the exception of Persia or modern Iran, uh, which had its own dynasty and warred at times with the Ottomans. So the Ottoman Empire has a good reason to think of itself as the center of the world. Um, you remember when I talked about the other day, uh, we talked about this notion of modern America as being a kind of analog, right? The Chinese are a little less curious about the outside world because they think they're at the center. The Ottomans were the same way. Remember, everyone comes to them. Constantinople was the great entrepot of the world, right? And you have these ships coming in from all over the place, burying goods, you know, laden down with luxury goods from the Far East. Some things from Europe, mostly, again, things like silver and gold. I mean, the Europeans were kind of minting coins that the Ottoman used. Other than that, there's not a whole else that they bought from Europe. They bought some wool, which they used, again, the raw materials they would process into textiles. There's one other thing that they did tend to import from Europe, though. Does anyone know what that is? One major product. The Ottomans imported it. 
mostly through middlemen, northern Africa. Hmm. Anyone want to take a guess? Remember, Europe is pretty backwards still, right? So they're not really producing a whole lot that the Ottomans want. Slaves. That's the other major export. Now, it's not something Europeans really wanted to export. It's not something you ever really voluntarily export. Well, some do. Obviously, there's always someone who profits. But no, for the most part, really, I mean, I, I wrote this up here. The last sort of, you know, famous, well-known, celebrated slave raid, um, you know, into the kind of northern European world was in the early 17th century. There were still a few sporadic raids. Um, but no, Muslim traders, they used to go up as far as England, even as far as Iceland. Um, now, the heart of the trade way back when, kind of in the, the medieval period, when the Islamic Empire was in its heart, was actually Italy. And the Italians are still sort of angry about this. Um, primarily, the trade was centered in the Mediterranean. It was mostly the people that we called Corsairs or Saracens. Um, it's actually, it's, it's sometimes forgotten these days because things have gone so far the other direction. But the very first war the United States actually fought as an independent country was actually against the Muslim slavers in North Africa. We called them the Barbary Corsairs, pirates of Barbary. By that point, of course, it was a lot smaller scale. It would be more like they would be pirates who would capture a ship and enslave the people. They wouldn't actually go onto the European coastland and enslave people. But still, centuries later, there was a kind of folk memory of this in Europe. They called it white slavery. You know, it was something that everyone was still afraid of. Basically, the slavers came from the south and they went to the north. Um, they came from the Islamic Empire, which was rich into poor Europe, and they brought back slaves. So, to get back again to perceptions, the Ottoman Empire, again, classical age, Suleiman Kanuni and all of that, center of the world economy. It's importing things from the rest of the world. Everyone wants to come there and trade because, you know, there's money to be made because they have money to buy things. Uh, they're bringing in slaves. They're also bringing in slaves from Russia. That's another thing the Russians never completely forgot about. You know, the slave raids would kind of go up into the north. Um, the Russians are just beginning at this stage to begin their own recovery from the long period, as they called it, the Tatar yoke, the Golden Horde, um, the Khans. Uh, in many ways, modern Russia really is a, a kind of a blend of the Turkic peoples that conquered Russia and, of course, the Slavs who were there before. And even a lot of those Slavs actually originally came from Scandinavia and were Normans. Like everywhere, it's a blend. But the way the Russians remembered, of course, yeah, a little bit distorted. You know, they remembered themselves as being conquered by the Muslims and then they fought back. Not unlike the way the Crusaders, remember, had gone to the Levant in the 11th century to reconquer the lands. I mean, this notion, it kind of undergirds the era from the European perspective. This phrase, Reconquista, which is associated with which country, mostly? Spain, right. Reconquista completed in 1492. We talked about that the other day, when the Moors, as they called, there are all these different names that Europeans had for Muslims, like Saracens and Moors. There they called them mostly the Moors. Like if you read Othello by Shakespeare, you know, there's this talk of a Moor, and you know, that just means basically a kind of a Muslim, usually someone who would come from North Africa, you know, to Europe. And in that era was still seen as, as threatening because they were the stronger power. Um, so the Spanish expelled the Moors. They also, of course, expelled a lot of Jews, and this is something actually the Ottoman Empire benefited from. Which is interesting when you kind of think about it, because from the perspective of the Christian world, again, remember, they're fighting back. You know, they were kind of coming out of their period of weakness and, and disunity when they were preyed upon at will by these Islamic slavers and Islamic powers and losing every battle. The Crusades, you know, they had temporarily won back some land, then they lost it. In this period, though, things from the European perspective are starting to go their way, right? They've won back Spain. The Russians are now pushing back. They reach, gradually they reach Astrakhan and the Caspian. That's by about 1540. You know, it takes them maybe another hundred years to kind of reach the Black Sea. But the Russians are starting to push back. The Spaniards, of course, the Christians, that is, are pushing back. But if you think about it from the Ottoman perspective, again, this question of kind of when did it start to change, you might not have noticed it that much yet. Remember, the Ottomans are still winning their own battles, right? I mean, they're beating the Hungarians. 1526, you have the great battle of Mohash. Opens the plains of Hungary. Great Budapest falls to Islam, falls to the sword. 
you know, falls into the Ottoman Empire. and actually becomes a pretty important city in the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Europe, that is, is still expanding. At not exactly the same time, even earlier, remember, the Ottomans had just swept up the Islamic heartland. Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Arabia, the holy places. So from the Ottoman perspective, things are going well. And you wouldn't necessarily know, I mean, Spain is far away. Spain was never a part of the Ottoman Empire. You know, nor was Muscovy. And so to them, maybe it doesn't seem like things have really changed that much yet. You know, the, um, the wave that begins to start appearing, at least in European eyes, that they are starting to win the battles that previously they were, they were losing, the Ottomans haven't completely noticed this yet. Like Lepanto is a great example of this. Lepanto was seen in the West as a great victory. This is this naval victory off the coast of Greece where the kind of holy league, as they were usually called in this era, you know, of a coalition of European powers defeated the Ottoman navy. Very decisive defeat, which to the Europeans was a big deal. Remember, they think of the Ottomans as the great power, the great bully that they're trying to fight back against. To the Ottomans, that wasn't, you know, good news. But again, it's not that big of a deal. The Ottomans still control most of Greece, the Peloponnese. They still control most of the lands. They haven't really lost any land yet. So far as they know, they're still doing well. Things were starting to turn against the Ottoman Empire, though, geopolitically and economically. This, too, it was a lesson that I don't think it really kind of sunk in right away. I talked about coffee and sugar just a little bit the other day, but this is particularly interesting because coffee, we now think of it as coming from where in the world? Like, where do most people buy their coffee from? Brazil, Brazil or maybe Colombia, right? Where does it come from originally? Do we know? Close, very close. Um, I mean, you hear different theories. Ethiopia, Yemen. Yeah, that area, kind of the Red Sea, Arabia, somewhere there. Everyone claims it comes from there originally. I think Ethiopia is the most commonly accepted place of origin. But anyway, you know, it comes from essentially, you might call it the Arab Middle East, the Islamic world. That's where it comes from. Um, sugar. Where does sugar come from? A little bit further east. I think, I think most people think that it comes originally from somewhere either in the Indian subcontinent or Persia or the Indian Ocean, somewhere in that area. We don't know exactly where it was first cultivated, but somewhere around there. Again, an area which is now in the Islamic world. So this is maybe the most important trade that the Ottomans have, in particular because it's growing. The Europeans are just starting to buy sugar. I mean, can you imagine a place like Paris without sugar? Vienna without sugar, or without coffee. I mean, it's astonishing to think these were relatively recent imports into Europe. They were imports which were controlled by the Islamic world. But then what happened? First, the Europeans went around Africa, remember, to set up a more direct route to the Indies. That's what Columbus was trying to do, but he failed. A Portuguese explorer, Vasto, Vasco da Gama, actually succeeded. It took a while for it to really sink in. It took a while before the Europeans really had made major indentations into the East Asian spice trade. But with coffee and sugar, it was actually something quite different. They actually started growing them in South America. That's why we now think they come from Colombia and Brazil. That is sugar. Or oh, sugar comes from the Caribbean islands. San Domingue was the great French sugar-producing island. So you have sugar and coffee, which were major exports from the Islamic world, which now, amazingly, European colonists began exporting to the Ottoman Empire. Now, if you look at this geopolitically, something much bigger is going on. And it doesn't just affect the Ottomans. It also affects the entire Mediterranean economy. Venice, remember I talked about, they were like a middleman, right? The Venetians, the Genoese, the Italians, they were the ones who sort of traded with the Muslims. You know, they would go to places like Cairo and Constantinople. They would go to the Ottoman Empire, or even before that, to the Mamluks. They would send traders, they would send merchants into the Islamic world. They would buy these things and then they would sell them to Europeans. And as most people who know modern European history know, you know, Italy had this great sort of outpouring of energy, we usually call it the Renaissance, right around this time, kind of 1400s, 1500s, after which Italy just kind of declines. It's no longer really very important. You now it gets colonized by the French and then the Austrians. It's never important again. Now, there are reasons for that that have to do with battles and wars, but the larger reason, if you look at economics and geopolitics, is that the center of the world economy shifted away from the Mediterranean. 
which obviously affected the Ottomans too. In fact, even more dramatically than it affected the Italians. Where did it shift to? The center, the center of gravity of the world economy. Right around, let's say, between 1500 and 1700. I mean, if you're going to talk about like a, a body of water, <laughs> where would you center the world economy? It's no longer the Mediterranean. Is it the Pacific Ocean? What's the other big ocean? The Atlantic. This is where the new trading happens. This is where the sugar trade, the coffee trade, some of these other new products like tobacco, which of course comes from North America, products like the potato, which actually becomes very important in Europe's economy. There's a curious thing about the potato is that grain was always particularly vulnerable in times of war because it had to be stored in like a single place, right? You need a silo to store grain. And so a sacking army could always take the grain and starve people. The potato, though, is a lot more durable. You can actually hide the potato. You can, like, if you're like a peasant, you're worried about, you know, soldiers coming and stealing your food. You can actually, like, dig a hole in the ground and hide your potatoes. You know, or put them somewhere in a cabinet in the kitchen or, like, under the floorboards. Potatoes actually were great because they were easy to store, easy to transport. They were very cheap. Um, and they were also fairly nutritive. You, know, you could actually live on potatoes alone. I wouldn't recommend it today, but you know, if you're desperate, you could live on potatoes. So you've got potatoes, you have corn, maize, you have tobacco, you have sugar. And all of these things are now traded primarily across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, of course, a lot of the labor is now done by these African slaves, but that becomes another part of the new world economy. And this time, it's the Europeans who are doing the slaving. I mean, in some ways, slavery has always been a part of the world. You can kind of tell which way the wind is blowing based on who is enslaving who else. The Europeans are no longer being enslaved. They are now the ones who are controlling the slave trade. They're the ones producing the products and exporting them. Again, it takes a while for all of this to really shake itself out. But let's say by about 1650, 1700, the Ottoman Empire is slowly becoming an economic backwater. And, sure enough, it starts to show up on the battlefield. Um, if you look at something like the Treaty of Karlovitz, which you probably know from Ottoman history. Karlovitz, I think. Yes, 1699. Um, you, how do you pronounce it? Karlovitz. Is it like itch? Karlovitz. Okay, so you call it Karlovitz. What's the year? 1699, all right, this is the first time when the Ottomans really lose a lot of territory, right? And they have to formally accept this in law. You know, the first time that they actually, interestingly, begin sending ambassadors to other countries. You know, they no longer just expect everyone to come to Constantinople and accept terms dictated to them. So again, you know, dates, movements, they're not always that precise. It takes a while for this kind of shift in power to become clear. But at least by this time, you can tell. Something has changed. Something has happened. The Ottoman Empire is no longer the center of the world, and no longer is it actually winning on the battlefield. You know, it's no longer just the isolated loss, like at Lepanto. Um, now the Ottomans are beginning to lose. Now, remember, I mean, some of this stuff was a little curious before, that even when they were at the center of affairs, you had things like this strange capitulation, remember, to the French we talked about, right? So that trading has already been a little bit subcontracted out to the Europeans. That again brings us back to this whole question of culture and institutions. You can just look at it and say, look, this is what happened, right? But then you have to ask why. Now, why was it Europeans who set out across the Atlantic Ocean or tried to negotiate a way? It could have been just accident, you know, geography. That's the kind of the, the jarred diamond angle, right? It's the accident of circumstance, you know, that Europeans bordered the Atlantic Ocean, the English, the Dutch, the French. You know, they all boarded the Atlantic Ocean. They didn't have access to the Mediterranean trade, and so they had to come up with other ways of getting access to the goods. Yeah, you know, that explains something, but still, you know, what kind of culture throws up somebody like a Vasco da Gama or a Columbus? I mean, you think about what it actually takes, you know, to voyage out into the middle of the ocean, the kind of sense of adventure and risk and danger. You remember, the technology was there in other places. The Chinese were building ships that were just as big, with just as much carrying capacity. 
Maybe this is where the Ottomans did have a kind of geographical disadvantage. The Ottoman Empire being essentially straddling the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, you know, neither of which has kind of winds, gale force winds, anywhere near as large as the Atlantic. They didn't have a need for these kinds of large ships. In fact, famously in the Mediterranean, it's always better to have faster, more maneuverable ships, you know, like the ancient triremes were rowed by oar. Sailing ships didn't do you a whole lot of good in the Eastern Mediterranean, whereas they did in the Atlantic. So some of it maybe has to do with that. But then again, even inside the Ottoman Empire, remember, there are all these European traders running around, right? You know, there are all these French and Italian and, you know, a little bit later, English traders. You don't have Ottoman traders going around in Europe. In fact, very few people from the Ottoman Empire even visited Europe until maybe like the 18th century. Why not? You know, there actually were discussions about Sharia law. You know, imams would actually pronounce on this sort of thing, like whether it was actually okay to visit <laughs> you know, a country held by the infidel, whether you were supposed to go there. Um, there, there were exceptions, there are always exceptions, like, you know, in, in case of, you know, you had to go negotiate captives or prisoners of war, you know, those kinds of things. There were kind of practical common sense reasons that you would be allowed. But the basic rule was no, you weren't supposed to go. I mean, yeah, if you're a part of an army that's fighting a war, you would, but not as a tourist. Why would you want to go, right? I mean, it's land of the infidels. It could be. I mean, it's, it's curious because you, you'd think that all religions would have a kind of similar attitude. Um, you know, Christianity, I mean, one way of describing Christianity is as the religion you know, with some of the firmest principles, but also the greatest hypocrisy. I mean, it's strange, because you think about something like um, banks, right? This whole question of uh, money lending, right, at interest, it's proscribed famously in the Quran, but then it's proscribed in the Bible too, right? So you would think you would have a problem with the development of banking and credit institutions in, in both cultures. For some reason, though, it seems to be Islam which is much stricter about it. You know, and I don't know why. I mean, there are a lot of different theories. I mean, you know about, what are the, I've forgotten what the term is for them. You know, kind of um, a Sharia-friendly banking institutions which are able to function, you know, to loan money at interest while still somehow being, there's a term for them. I'm forgetting what it is. Do any of you know what I'm talking about? Kind of Islamic banking institutions. Um, I'll go look this up. If, if none of you remember the term, I'll, I'll look it up in time for the next lecture. But it's interesting because these days, you know, there are a few institutions which have sprung up. But for the most part, even like, let's say in the 1970s, you know, during like the Arab oil embargo, when suddenly the Middle East got, you know, rich with all of this oil money, they were still doing most of their banking in the West because they didn't have their own banking institutions. You know, they didn't have ways of drawing interest on their capital. Um, and again, it doesn't make sense on the surface because Christianity is just as strict in theory. Um, yes, it's true that in the Christian world it was mostly Jews who famously handled money lending. One of the reasons why they were always hated, you know, because, I mean, this is like the theme of the Merchant of Venice, one of Shakespeare's plays, is Shylock. And I mean, this, this whole anti-Semitic prejudice that has to do with banking. But obviously there were a lot of Jews in, in the Islamic world as well. No, I don't know. I mean, these are interesting questions. I don't know if they really have answers. Um, but it was certainly true that sophisticated banking institutions, which involve things like bills of lading and letters of credit, and later on the development of you know, the bond market and all of these secondary trading industries, which allowed the sale of things like government debt to third parties, which eventually allowed you know, the creation of these massive debt-fueled spending booms in places like England, you know, where the government could keep borrowing money endlessly, seemingly, uh, a little bit like the United States does today. This didn't happen in the Islamic world. Like, if you look at, um, yeah, if you look even again at the Golden Age, I'm thinking of, have any of you read the Pamuk novel? I know Pamuk is kind of a lightning rod in Turkey, but you know the one I'm talking about, Binim Adım Kırmızı. Have any of you read it? Yeah, you've read it. Um, there's a lot of discussion of inflation, you remember, right? Do you, do you remember what that's about? Like, what's happening? Um, I cannot uh, explain. In English, I understand. <laughs> um, 
Turkish. <laughs> you could try to explain quickly in Turkish, or well, it's something about silver, I think, right? What, what is Turkish for silver? I've forgotten. Gümüş, right? There's something with gümüş, right? What's happening? Tamam. Uh huh. Did anyone else read it? But a madam kırmızı. You didn't like it, okay. Um, well, I read it a long time ago too, so I don't remember it that well. All I remember is that there's all this talk about silver, you know, debasing of the coins. There's all this talk about it, but no one understands what's happening, right? Because the coins aren't even minted there. The coins are all coming from Italy, right? So it's like they're sort of blaming it on the infidels in a way. They're sort of blaming it on the foreigners because the foreigners are the ones who they think are manipulating the currency. You know, which is really interesting because you think about, well, maybe that is happening. You know, in which case, maybe you should just make your own silver coins. You know? But in a way, they had never really developed that whole process, you know, kind of a sophisticated process of controlling the money supply because it had always kind of been done from outside. Yes, the Italians, you know, had been trading and controlling way back in, you know, the Byzantine times of the Second Rome. The Italians had very, very, for a very long time, been in a certain sense in control of most of the economy of the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the Ottomans inherited, again, most of the revenue from the trade in terms of customs and tariff tolls. But they never completely did figure out what to do about the money supply. Um, this is it's such a curious thing. When I was actually researching um, kind of uh, secret missions in the Middle East during the First World War, I discovered that the coin that was actually being used in the Arab Middle East, the coin that was actually most widely used, was the Maria Teresa Thaler, which was a coin minted in Habsburg, Austria in 1780. And it was still being used in the Middle East in 1914. It was the primary unit of exchange, which is really curious. You think about something like money, though. I mean, it, it seems so basic, right, money. But then you think about how important it is in our daily lives. And you think about how extraordinary it is that, you know, we can just take money out of our wallet. I mean, this has Ataturk's picture on it, right? It says 50 lira, 50 Turk liras. I guess a few years ago it would have said 50 million, you know, right? Now it says 50, right? And I can go and I can get things with this, right? I can turn this into what? I can turn it into food. You know, I can go to a grocery store. I can go to a restaurant. I can buy cleaning supplies. You know, I can go to Practicare and, and I can get myself... Um, yeah, paintings for my wallet, anything I want, right? But what happens if tomorrow this is no longer worth 50 lira? It still says 50, but I can no longer buy the same things. All of that depends on the full faith and credit of the Turkish government. Yeah, you know, much like if I took out one of these, you know, a dollar, I mean, what does this say after all? The United States of America, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Now, the dollar, of course, is much more widely used around the world. It's kind of the global reserve currency. But ultimately, anyone who trades in dollars is depending on the full faith and credit of the United States government. Because any day, the U.S. government could just suddenly choose to print another 10 trillion of these. And then its value would plummet immediately. So that a lot of things around the world depend on the arcane decisions made by central bankers. Or in that era, it wasn't central bankers. I mean, it wasn't quite that sophisticated yet. It would be a, you know, a private bank that might have been tied to a city-state like Venice or Genoa or a little bit later, you know, Antwerp or one of the northern European cities. Now, that too, of course, migrated from Venice to the north. And that was another real disadvantage for the Ottoman Empire. All the centers of global finance and credit and trade moved to places like Antwerp and Amsterdam and then London and then later New York. They migrated with the trade. Now, I don't know which, it's a sort of chicken or the egg thing. You know, is it the commodities traded that matter or is it the banking institutions that matter? Probably it's a little bit of both. But no matter how you look at it, by around 1700, the Ottoman Empire was really falling behind. And all of these institutions we depend on today in the international banking arena, of course, were originated in Northern Europe. Actually, some of them started in Italy, but the, the kind of the forerunners of the modern central banks actually came from Amsterdam and London. Um, we'll look at that in a few weeks' time. I just wanted to check the time. Looks like we have maybe about uh, five or ten minutes left. Did anyone read at least uh, the Kennedy 
rise and fall of the great powers? You read it. So what did you make of it? I mean, what, what is he saying? What does he think matters? Like, what was the advantage Europe had? What, what didn't you agree with then? What didn't you agree with? He always said the logical thing, but mm -hmm. sometimes he says, uh, how can I say, uh, about two. Uh, He's exaggerating. Oh, he exaggerates. Yeah. So the kinds of things he exaggerates then are about. Are they about Europe, or are they more about, about Europe? Um, that Europe was always fighting, or that this was a, like a good thing? Yeah, it's strange, right? I mean, they keep killing each other in these horrible wars. <laughs> and yeah, he's saying it's sort of a good thing because they learn a lot. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, he and Hansen, they're not that different in that sense. They both think war is very important. You know? And probably it is. But again, maybe it's not as important as you know, trade and economics and all these other things. Or maybe, again, it's, you know, it's that the Europeans learned how to kill really effectively. I mean, is, is that sort of what he's saying? Or that they learned how to build better weapons, is that it? Better weapons, so. Yeah, I mean, you build a better mousetrap, you build a better cannon, um, you know, you build more effective repeating rifles. It will give you an advantage. Um, it is curious, though, because it's not that the Ottomans didn't have guns, remember, that they didn't have cannons. They did. And they knew how to use them. Oh, they certainly did. Uh, I mean, even the, the Mamluks, when they encounter Napoleon in 1798, most of them have guns. But what also matters is tactics, drill, you know, leadership, and sometimes the decisions of individual commanders. You know, and that's something that someone like Kennedy doesn't write about, because he's looking at all the big stuff. Did anyone read um, the Hansen book about the Western way of war? It's just 12 pages. <laughs> Did anyone read it? Okay, well, you know, that's again, that's interesting. That's mostly about war. M maybe you like the diamond reading better, you know, because that's all about environment and um, geography, things like agriculture. There are different ways of looking at history. You know, you've got the, the very long run, the medium run, and then you know, Hansen's kind of talking about immediate things, things that maybe don't change over time, but involving military tactics. Well, I have a suggestion. How about for next week we do the reading, and then we can have a better discussion.